Welcome back to Financial Therapy. It's not just about the money. I'm personal financial planner, columnist, and financial therapist, Rick Kaler. Research tells us that 90% of all financial decisions are made emotionally, not logically. For nearly four decades, I've been helping people make better money decisions. So what makes my financial worldview different from most financial experts? I blend the nuts and bolts of financial advice with the emotions that drive making them. Good money decisions are not just about the money. So let's get started with today's episode. Welcome back for another episode. I want to share something with you that was quite a learning experience for me and I think pretty powerful for the um, person that uh, interviewed me. And this was an interview on IFS informed financial therapy, which is uh, the the combination of internal family systems with financial therapy. And I I found it to be one of the most effective methodologies in helping clients resolve money issues. From my perspective as a financial therapist whose discipline comes from financial planning, I am not a master degree therapist. And I think I, I've talked a little bit about this. So the uh, power of IFS, which is a protocol applied to financial therapy, was recently recorded in an interview that I did with Dr. Helen Lees who is the editor of Parts and Self, which is the international voice of the IFS Foundation. And through a series of connections, um, Dick Schwartz is familiar with my work, and he introduced introduced me to the uh, president of the uh, IFS Foundation, who got me in touch with... uh, Dr. Lees, who was quite intrigued with um, adding IFS to money issues and and called me and said she wanted to do an interview and she wanted to record the interview. And that uh, she'd like the interview to kind of be interactive or even be a part session with her. So we did that interview and it... uh, It wasn't a, what I want to say, a traditional IFS parts session. It was uh, more of a coaching session, right? Because it was an interview where I'm explaining IFS um, informed financial therapy. And then we kind of did a little demonstration of what that could look like. And I think what, what came out of this was a demonstration of how powerful the impact of applying the IFS process is to money issues, even when the process is not specifically or rigidly, I probably should say rigidly, followed. And I think maybe you have to be somewhat familiar with IFS to understand what I'm saying. Uh, the reason that somebody like myself can be certified in in uh, internal family systems uh, as a practitioner is that the training is very specific. The protocol is very specific. It's the same whether you're a licensed therapist or not, because it really removes you, the facilitator, from offering any opinions, any advice, having any agenda. So in a way, it can take a lot of unlearning to learn the protocol. So so I I did this interview with Helen, which is on their website. And I can probably give you that that link toward the end of the, the podcast. And once I kind of explained what IFS informed financial therapy is, so if you're going to listen to the video, you've got to kind of weighed into it for a while. She brought up a 
an issue she wanted just to explore on how IFS could be applied to a pattern she had of buying art supplies and tools that she stockpiled, but never used. So uh, we did that. And I mean, when it comes to, to doing financial therapy, I am, I've seen very, very few quick fixes. Uh, this is not something where you schedule one or two sessions and you're done. You know, money issues can be pretty deeply ingrained and anything that's deeply ingrained is typically not a quick fix. So I didn't really know how far we were going to get with one session that wasn't even a full session. And I have to say, I was just blown away with how quickly Helen worked through the whole process of realizing that the part of her buying the supplies was protecting an exiled young part of her for whom art supplies were a proxy for receiving her parents' love. So while we were doing this, and you can kind of watch it, it moves so quickly, she discovered that she could show love to that part now by connecting it to herself. In IFS, that's called self to part which is the whole goal of helping the protector stand back because the exiled part has been in relationship with the protector. And that typically hasn't worked so well because the protector's job is to keep that part just as exiled and isolated as possible. So the, one of the goals of IFS is, is to connect the wounded parts, the exiled parts, with what IFS calls the self. And um, she found out that she connect, can connect this part to herself and eliminate the need of the tool buying protector to continue to buy tools and freeing it up to look for opportunities to do other things and use the stockpile tools in, in perhaps some other way. And when you listen to this, you'll hear me say a couple of times in here. Now, I'm kind of leaning into this. I wouldn't normally do this in an IFS session because I was I was connecting some dots and uh, suggesting a little bit of analysis. So if you watch this, I, re I really want to bring attention to that. <laughs> I mean, in a way, it feels like I did IFS wrong. And yet the outcome was rather phenomenal to me. Two days after this session, Helen emailed me and said, I just went out to the supermarket and was another person. I believe this is connected to our talking with the tools part. I find that completely bonkers. I also did an online look at something to buy and I didn't buy it. No intention, just an internal discussion between parts. That's two days later. Two weeks later, she writes and says, I continue not to buy tools. I can't really explain it, but there's been a shift since our session. Subtle, but with real-world outcomes. Wow. Two weeks after that, she emailed me again. I'm great. This is a miracle, in all caps. I've increased my savings due to having bought no new tools and only a very few cheap books since we spoke. Well, I was just kind of... Uh, blown away with that. And I mean, my experience with IFS informed financial therapy is that clients not only gain understanding around their financial issues, but also make measurable and specific changes in their financial behavior. And I may have said this before on the podcast, I had one client who'd been unable to save and maintained consistent, began to maintain consistent uh, monthly savings. After doing therapy, another client began to invest for retirement. Others became able to make conscious choices and take action around giving and spending and employment in areas when in the past they'd been frozen in indecision. So making progress isn't unusual. Making progress in an interview <laughs> is uh, just kind of blew me away. And what I'm 
saying is that a typical IFS informed financial therapy session, it's different from a usual IFS therapy process in that it combines the financial coaching with IFS protocols. So typically, there are specific financial concerns that bring the client to financial therapy, and this is uh, usually a financial issue that isn't being resolved by gaining more knowledge. So the um, client often understands the problematic behavior that's going on, but hasn't had any success in altering the behavior, no matter how hard they try. So generally, they feel stuck. And that's what I'll tell somebody when they ask me, well, how do you know if you need financial therapy? And I just like, go, well, are you stuck around some uh, financial issue? So with a new client, typically I'll hand out questionnaires or send them questionnaires on their specific financial such situation and offer exercises, assessments, valuations. I use the KMSI, that's the Quants Money Script Inventory, uh, almost with every new client. And I had sent Helen a KMSI uh, to do. And so this can actually just off this, you can typically go right into a, um, a financial therapy ses session. So also unlike IFS protocol, where, as I said before, giving advice is not encouraged. It's not unusual for clients to ask for financial advice during a session. And it's often quite appropriate for the financial therapist to offer additional knowledge because it is, two words, financial therapy. So when talking about financial specifics during a session, I will note any resistance or dissonance or money scripts, money burdens that arise in that financial discussion of the session and invite clients to check in with themselves internally. You know, if, if I'm giving out some suggested recommendations or solutions and the client's like, yep, 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 oh, I didn't know that, didn't know that, great, I'll do that, boom, 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 with no resistance, well, that's probably a pretty clear indication that all they needed was more knowledge. In 80% of the situations, more knowledge is not needed. So during talking about the money, the clients can become aware of conflicting beliefs, polarized parts, you know, a part that part of me wants to buy this and a part of me doesn't. A part of me wants to save and a part of me that doesn't. Uh, difficult emotions that are quite normal or thoughts that might come up that all can impede progress or stop progress in taking action on a financial issue. So by checking in with these messages and thoughts and emotions that come from this place of stuckness are actually coming from various parts of themselves. We call these trailheads or a further explore, exploration using the IFS process. So as a... Uh, IFS financial therapist, a big part of that is knowing when to offer additional knowledge and when to abstain and just um, uh, do that interior ex ex uh, exploration. So, and also, the, you know, you can, oftentimes we talk about money in the first part of the session and then do what I would call a formal IFS parts session in the second part but it can be it can be sessions where the whole session is on the money and other sessions where the whole session is doing a part session so Helen and I kind of did a little bit of both except the first part was the interview and the second part was a little bit of which I'll call IFS coaching so during this period of time uh, that ensued I offered Helen a full parts session which she was excited to do. So we did an, a full IFS session. And you'll see on the video at the very end, obviously there's a, 
there's a new video that was spliced in, which was the opening of our part session and the closing of our part session. I don't, oh, that's on the demo. Sorry. I think what you'll see is the whole part session. I think she's, she's uh, put that up. Uh, I did a, a demo that I showed at the um, Financial Therapy Association, which just included parts of that. And two weeks after doing that part session, she emailed me this. I don't know what the hell has happened to me. I do feel like I am a me I don't know very well, which is a bit frightening, although acceptable. But I get a sense of it all being just fine and healthy, and there's no resistance. I've had a couple of days this week that weren't so easy due to difficult things occurring, but I took, took it all in my stride, and I was calm. I feel generally connected. I feel confident like never before. I'm not brilliantly, brilliantly calm, uh, but I am calmer. I do feel clear-headed for sure. I don't think the full extent of the outcome is over either. Now that just gives me chill bumps to read. I mean, I know this stuff is powerful. It's just like I didn't know it was that powerful to, to have that type of a shift out of such a brief encounter uh, with IFS informed financial therapy. I think one of the most powerful things, I think I've talked about this before, of IFS is that clients really respond pretty positively to learning that parts behind money beliefs, money scripts or behaviors that would appear to be bad or illogical, the behavior being bad or illogical, are really motivated by good intentions, that every money script has a good intention. And that once they discover the intention, when they be then that behavior makes perfect sense. So understanding the protective purposes behind the behaviors is especially powerful because of the high level of shame associated with money issues. And, again, we've talked about this before, but shame around financial burdens, around money scripts, usually stems from some type of trauma, which can be, but doesn't have to be financial in nature. So because money touches everything we do, it's integral to all aspects of our life, distressing or disturbing financial experiences can just overwhelm our system, overwhelm our parts and become traumatic, especially when we are young and we're young children. And, you know, a, a wide variety of financial advance and circumstances uh, may qualify as either a one-time, a one-off, which I would call a big T trauma, or complex trauma, which would be a lot of little T, T traumas. So a trauma can be something that would seem like, just like insignificant to others, but it can still be really traumatic for the person, especially a young child that has no context of what is happening. So it's pretty powerful to learn that problematic money behaviors are not a character flaw, but they are responses to trauma that were developed to protect us against future emotional pain. And when we understand that, when I got a hold of that, when a client gets a hold of that, it really reduces self-blame and strengthens the, uh, the belief, the possibility that change is possible. So uh, I think all this can sometimes happen rapidly. And this can even happen when clients are not fully familiar with the IFS process. And the practitioner, the facilitator, the therapist can be there just to help guide the client through this. 
So like I, I said, the first uh, session with Helen was really abbreviated form of the IFS process, if you watch that demo, but it really serves as a pretty vivid demonstration that there's times in IFS-informed financial therapy sessions when it, it's not necessarily to go through every step of the protocol or those steps can be happening in rapid fire because clients can leap ahead to essential insights. And so, like with anything, especially with IFS, the therapist, facilitator, practitioner's role is to follow the client where the client leads. And having the flexibility to focus on the outcome rather than ticking off every step of the protocol. So, the whole, the whole intent is using the tools of IFS to help clients make lasting and permanent behavioral changes. And I, I will remind you <laughs> that I am the guy in, uh, in uh, a week-long training with uh, Dick Schwartz, who's the founder of IFS. I watched him do a demo. And this was pretty early on. And this was happening in the demo where the client was progressing through these steps without him actually doing them. Or they were happening so fast, rapid fire internally you, that, that you didn't see this happening. <laughs> At the end, he always holds a debrief. And I popped up my hand and I said, Dick, can you tell me why you didn't follow the IFS protocol? And he looked at me just kind of with a little bit of, um, I don't know, if he was perplexed, <laughs> but uh, maybe a little bit of surprise. Maybe it was annoyance. He says, Rick, I am the protocol. <laughs> and I look back at him I'm like, oh, my God, did I really say that? Uh, but I, I have parts that are very rigid in following protocol step by step, right? So this makes kind of sense to me. Other personality types don't have this problem. I think I've told you I'm an Enneagram, a, a type one. I fix an eight around the type one, which amongst other things is the perfectionist. So... I think this is why this is such a shock and a surprise to me that using IFS uh, in the way that I did was so impactful. So Helen has reported to me since that last uh, conversation that that when this the session we that the, that the session we did continued to subtly but continually support her connection, which we call self leadership with her parts and th that this experience has made her life much easier in many ways, not just in the respect or attitude to finances. And that makes sense. You know, so much about finances, just how we, how we deal with them extends to how we deal with so many things. She is pretty surprised that the, the work with a focus on finances can touch her inner world so widely and so deeply. And she has reported to me being now convinced and impressed by IFS uh, without a doubt about it as a way to improve one's life and live better. Uh, this was, I think, um, was, was pretty impactful. Again, that doing this around uh, money reached out to so many other areas and, and some areas that I, I have not talked about. Uh, that weren't in included with this. She's underscored to me that it was the flexibility that I showed, which is kind of endearing to me since, I, like I said, I can be so rigid. You know, as she just threw, flew through these protocols, and that was one of the keys to her healing and her new relationships with her parts was that I didn't impede that by saying, wait, 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 you can't be doing so she just says, basically, her parts were so hungry to change, and they did. And that was because 
I was not rigid in my approach to how to support her with the IFS model. So she said it was uh, my flex- flexibility that really was one of the keys to the work that we did. So, as I said, I think in the beginning, this was as much of a learning experience for me as it uh, was uh, transformational for Helen. If you would like to uh, take a look at the demo, uh, go to the uh, foundationifs.org. That's foundationifs.org slash news. And there should be a link there to uh, the Parts and Self um, online magazine. And I think that's where where you Thanks again for joining me, and I look forward to talking with you again next week. Thanks for joining me, Rick Kaler, for another episode of Financial Therapy. It's not just about the money. This is where I combine the nuts and bolts of financial advice with the emotions that drive making them. Remember, every financial behavior, whether it appears illogical to you or others, makes perfect sense when we understand the underlying beliefs, feelings, and thoughts. Sign up for my weekly blog at financialawakenings.com. I hope you'll join me again for our next episode.